We're so happy to finally be back in person with you today. I'm Diana Diaz and I am the Community and Engagement Manager here at University Area CDC and I will be the host of today's Third Quarter Partners Coalition. If you haven't had the opportunity to view one of our recent virtual Partners Coalition gatherings or if you're simply new to the group, this event is made up of three different segments community investment, focusing forward, and small biz equals big impact. Our first presentation, centered on community investment in the Uptown University area, focuses on the University Area Cultural Campus, a new development that's currently underway at the corner of North 20th Street and East 136th Avenue, adjacent to our Harvest Hope Park. For this segment, we once again have Sarah Combs from UACDC, along with Jody Beck from Traction Architecture. So let's start off the presentation by taking a look at a video that was shot on site at the cultural campus development. Good morning. We're standing in the heart of the university area community at 137th Ave and 20th Street. Just across the street from the Harvest Hope Park, we have acquired two acres of land through our land banking program and are building the university area cultural campus. The mission of the cultural campus is to serve as a navigational hub connecting community residents with trusted partners who are providing direct programming and services through a holistic approach. As Diana said, I'm here with my friend Jody Beck, who is the founder and principal of Traction Architecture and has been working with us to bring the vision of the cultural campus to life. University Area CDC was so incredibly fortunate to find an architecture partner who believes design really drives how we carry out our daily lives. Jody's approach is to take what we can see, touch, and experience and weave it all together to make it purposeful in this site, asking the community along the way to, to program the architecture so it invites people to interact with it, as well as each other. Jody, why don't you go ahead and tell the coalition what we are working to accomplish here on the site? Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here and to work with Sarah on this important community development. Sarah selected our firm, Traction Architecture, to lead the design of the cultural campus. It's been exciting to collaborate with UACDC to transform the neighborhood through a combination of community programming and thoughtful design. When we first encountered the future cultural campus site, we were inspired by the work that had already been done with the creation of Harvest Hope Park, and we were excited by the opportunity to extend that vision into the cultural campus. Our cultural campus design focuses on embedding amenities within the community in a walkable environment, eventually creating a vibrant streetscape that connects the cultural campus to Harvest Hope Park through sidewalks, street lighting, and storefronts that activate 20th Street and encourage safe walking and biking. Our design strategy has been to take a surgical approach that considers the context of the neighborhood, incorporating not only brand new buildings, but also creative renovations of existing structures on the site. The final build out of the campus will include the renovated warehouse, a new building on the corner of 136th Ave and 20th Street, affordable housing on the north two lots, and a public plaza for festivals and events. The project goals are ambitious and we envision this transformation being phased over time. We broke the project down into four phases. As Jody said, this development consists of four phases. Phase one of the cultural campus is almost complete, which included the redevelopment of two apartments into two office spaces for our community partners, Casa Chiapas and Candu. Casa Chiapas serves the Chiapas Mexican community by providing education, health and wellness and immigration services. Candu serves the Caribbean community by hosting cultural events, putting on back to school events and sending relief to distressed Caribbean communities. They will be moving into these new offices in August and start providing services. Through funding from a Hillsborough County Community Development Block Grant and the Sperlino Foundation, the University Area CDC was able to complete the renovation of these offices, acquire additional land, demolish one building, and prepare the site for the next three phases. Phase two, the phase we are entering, includes rehabilitation of the existing warehouse to create a space for community residents and businesses to have full access to programs and services. We were excited about the opportunity to reuse the structure of the warehouse and creatively adapt it to a new use. As the cultural campus develops, the warehouse building can serve as a kind of touchstone to the site's past. It connects the campus to its surroundings, reflects the industrial feel of the neighborhood, and provides a counterpoint to future new construction. One of the key design goals was the idea of transparency and openness. We wanted the community to be able to see the exciting activities happening inside and throughout the building. The renovated exterior will incorporate glass storefront entries to welcome people into the space. Perforated aluminum canopies will provide shade over the entry and activate the exterior space with light and shadow throughout the day. 
The existing concrete block wall will be painted with a mural that will reflect the vibrancy of the community and provide a backdrop for the future plaza space. Inside, the warehouse will contain 4,800 square feet of new community spaces for UACDC and their partner organizations. We will enter a dramatic double height space that serves both as an entry lobby and a large gathering space for community events. A series of folding wood partitions separates an adjacent area which can be either closed off for workshops or open to extend the event space. A sculptural wood staircase leads up to an art nook and a classroom with a glass wall that provides a visual connection to the activities happening below. Beyond the classroom, an open hallway looks down into the event space and leads to a series of five offices. Flexibility was also a key factor in the design. The building will accommodate a diversity of programs such as educational workshops, prodigy art classes, get moving fitness classes, financial advising, literacy training, healthcare services, immigration services, and legal counseling. Phase three includes building a brand new 12,000 square foot cultural center to help families and individuals achieve their highest potential for self-sufficiency. The cultural center will include commercial space for local businesses, programming for youth and adults, as well as a beautiful plaza that just ties the campus together in an intentional way to build community efficacy and support holistic services. We envision a neighborhood where residents have access to the key determinants of their well-being while promoting inclusion. Phase four preserves and expands affordable housing options that create healthy, safe, and affordable housing for families of various sizes and incomes. We love the idea of incorporating a housing component into the cultural campus because it will help to activate the campus day and night. We envision two rows of housing that share a courtyard space which serves as a pedestrian path to connect the campus to Harvest Hope Park. The housing along 20th Street would contain front porches and sidewalks to contribute to a vibrant streetscape. And the key to this development is engaging residents in the process of creation, implementation, and management of the services and programs that are really intrinsically designed to improve the economic, educational, and social levels of the neighborhood. By strengthening this community and potentially transforming the current system to support marginalized communities and people of color, we will be able to close the disparity gap. University Area CDC is so incredibly thankful for all the partners and stakeholders that have supported this community's vision of building a cultural campus here in the heart of the community. And because the cultural campus is such a large mixed use development, we will be launching a capital campaign in the near future to help raise funds to make this dream a reality. So we will be counting on your support. Thank you all so much for learning more about the community investments happening in the university area. Be sure to join the UACDC on October 21st at their next Partners Coalition gathering, where they will share with you the plans for brand new townhomes that will be built right across the street for residents in this community to own. It is my pleasure to partner in this meaningful work of community equity and investment, as I truly believe that together we are so much stronger. Yeah. Whew. Thank you, Sarah and Jody, for that awesome presentation. It's always so exciting to see plans like this and the hard work of so many people coming to fruition. We look forward to watching this project develop over the next several phases and encourage you to visit uacdc.org for updates as things progress. Now let's move right along to the Focusing Forward segment. During our last virtual gathering, we featured a panel discussion centered on juvenile and criminal justice. For today's conversation, we focus on the topic of youth, schools, and our future. And as with each quarter's panel discussion, this topic was determined from a community conversation that was held in partnership with Safe and Sound Hillsboro. That conversation established topics specific to the Uptown University area, which would be beneficial for Partners Coalition members to hear further dialogue on. For each panel discussion, key stakeholders are identified to discuss real concerns, opportunities, and initiatives based on the given topic. For today's conversation, Mr. Freddie Barron, Executive Director of Safe and Sound Hillsboro, will once again serve as the group's moderator. Our panelists include Kylia Carswell, Community Partnership School Director for Moore Elementary, Stevie Hodgkins, Hillsboro County Teacher and UACDC Board Member, Shayla Solomon, Moore Elementary Secretary and Parent whose son is going into the fourth grade at Moore, and Emil Hernandez Mesa, an 11th grade student at Hillsboro High School IB. Mr. Barton, the floor is yours. So good morning to everyone. Um, everyone just give yourselves a round of applause for all the work that you do in the community and partnering with UACDC. So let's start with that. And we're just gonna go right into it and we're just gonna ask all the panelists to just introduce themselves a little bit more. 
I want you to tell us who you are and what you do with the University Area CDC or what do you do in this university area. Starting with Steve. Um, so my name is Stevie Hodgkins. I am going into my sixth year teaching science, seventh and eighth grade, and I've been part of the UACDC board for about a year and a half. Uh, hello, my name is Emil Hernandez. I am a student at Hillsborough High School IB. I've been with Prodigy for what, eight, nine years? <laughs> yeah, I've been a student here. My, my mom works here, you know. Most of my <laughs> friends are from here. Uh, most of my role models are from here, you know, just kind of like in the in the in the family here, you know. Good morning. I'm Kylia Carswell, Community Partnership School Director at Moore Elementary, which is right up the street from here. I have been in this role for almost four years. And since I've joined, I've become a member of many communities and uh, many committees here at UACDC. And we look forward to continuing the partnership that we have. UACDC is one of our six core partners as a community partnership school, which we'll tell you more about that. And my name is Shayla Solomon. I work at Moore. I've been there for six years now as a secretary. And then this year, I'm moving into a parent liaison position. So that's fun. Um, born and raised in Tampa. My son's going to fourth grade. And that's it. So fourth grade, that's exciting. So <laughs> it's too close to like adulthood. <laughs> it's like fourth grade going on graduating. Yeah, right. yeah. So today's forum is youth, schools, and our future, right? And so I want to first give the first question to Stevie. Um, we are now still in the wake of this pandemic, and we know that the district has made some decisions, and we are now going back 100% brick and mortar. So I want to know from your perspective, what do you think? How, how prepared? Is your school how prepared is the district to welcome back our students and what are some things that parents need to know as well as students um, as far as how their health and safety is going to be ensured i know at my school we are so excited to be back and to be back a hundred percent as a faculty because um, a lot of our teachers were e-learning so we're just so excited to be like one big family again and um, I know masks are optional this year. That's probably one of the biggest things parents need to know, that uh, masks are a choice. Um, some things that I hope that the district will carry on, and I've seen in the news, that um, our continued partnership with USF Health and Tampa General uh, will continue. Um, I believe that we will also uh, have like a COVID coordinator, which we did last year, which if, students or faculty are exposed, they can um, be quickly tested uh, through um, Tampa General. So, but we are very excited to be back. Emil, you're, were you brick and mortar last year or were you e-learning? I was fully e-learning. Fully e-learning. So yeah. now, how do you feel about going back to school? Um, I, I can speak for myself and some of my friends. I think we're all um, very, very excited to go back to school, you know. Um, I think just the main thing would be the the learning curve, you know, because um, when you transition to online, it's a whole different way of learning, a whole different way of studying, just, you know, interacting in school. So I think we just need to be like, let know our options and our, and the people that can help us just coming back into into school, you know. So you feel that as an e, as a former e-learner, you're already behind the, you're behind the eight ball? I mean, I, I wouldn't say behind. I'd just say, um, there's gonna be some learning curves, you know, like like just the whole way we're gonna, like the studying, the just, just like the way you talk to people, the way everything, the interactions, everything is so different online and we've gotten accustomed to it, you know? So it's just um, our school counselors to let us know like how, how we can make this process a lot easier, um, you know, be given our tools, you know? And Stevie, I guess I want you to respond to that. Are teachers aware of this, this concern from students? Um, yes, I was part of e-learning and brick and mortar last year, and I've heard some a lot of the same concerns from my seventh graders going to eighth graders, because um, some of them literally have not been back on the campus since sixth grade. That's a long time. Right. Um, so we are very aware, and the district has published um, some plans in that uh, we go back August 2nd, and so we will be training and learning how to address the concerns of students.
So, Shayla, you've got, you've got a unique role. You've got two roles, right? So, one, you're working at a school, and then two, you're a parent of a, of a young person that's going back to school. So, what are your concerns, and how do you feel that Mord is prepared as we get ready for August 10th? As a person who works at the school, I'm excited. Like, we see kids that I worked all summer. So, we saw kids that came in for summer school who I haven't seen since COVID, and they were like, Oh my gosh, look at the school. You painted a wall. I was like, yes, sweetie, we're still here. So I'm excited to see all the kids. Like you said, masks are, aren't mandatory. So that is a barrier that a lot of parents won't have to deal with. But as a parent, my son wasn't e-learning because I had to work. So he had to come to work with me. Um, it will be different though, because it was different this past school year, it was less kids in the class. They didn't move around as much because of COVID. So he has to get used to actually getting out of his chair and walking in line more often and just being more involved within the school because we'll be able to have more functions, you know, pet rallies, parties, different, hopefully like our, what is it? Um, Like the Thanksgiving event that we do. So. It will be different. It won't be as different as, you know, if he was e-learning, but it's time. These kids are ready. Kalia, if you could, in this, this first part of the segment, you know, you're an executive over at Mort, and we've got a parent and also uh, an employee over at Mort, and we know our little ones are ready to get back to school. They're ready to see their friends. They're ready to learn. They're ready to engage. What is Mort, how is Mort prepared what are some new exciting things that you want to announce, not just for parents, but to all of the partners in the university area? All things more. All things more. I love that. We need to use that as a hashtag. We're all about marketing and branding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say Freddie told us. We'll put your name on there. Um, no, at more, we're just super excited to be back into the full steam ahead mode, trying to get things ready, prepared, um, getting teachers coming back on campus. Um, as a community partnership school, we have four pillars that we focus on. One is health and wellness. One is community engagement through family, through our family efforts, um, expanded learning, and then also collaborative leadership. And so under those pillars, we have different tenets that we propose with our students, our staff, our families, our community partners. Um, again, I'm giving you numbers. We have six core partners that work with us, UACDC being one of them. The other one is USF. We have Tampa Family Health, who's here today. Tampa Innovation, who's also here today. Children's Home Society, who actually I am employed through. I am not a district employee. And then of course the school district. So with those partners and all of our donors and sponsors, we are able to provide services and programs that benefit not only our students, our staff, but also the community. One of the things that we're working on right now, and if you go look at our cafeteria, you're going to say, whoa, just don't ever try to walk in our cafeteria before school starts, is um, back to school supplies. We really work hard to take some of those burdens and, and obstacles away from the parents. That's part of the push of being a community partnership school is what can we remove that will allow the students to focus on their academic success and also the parents to be able to be better parents in terms of academics and helping their students be better learners. We don't ask our parents to provide school supplies in, at any point. Um, if a student comes to our school and they enroll, we provide every school supply that they need for that school year. There's nothing the parent needs to provide outside of it. If they want to, they can provide a backpack. But we're able to do that because of our sponsorships, our donors, those that give to us, that we have Amazon lists out right now and donors are buying off the list and sending it directly to the school, which is benefiting us. We're sorting through all those supplies and then our teachers will come in and they will shop through the supplies to get enough supplies for every student that enrolls in their classroom that's on their roster. Now, if you know more, you know more. It's more of a transient type of school. We have kids coming and going constantly. So we have to keep a reserve of school supplies. Um, and so we'll, we have a place to stock and, and uh, store those school supplies as well. But again, that's just one of the things that we do to kind of take that burden off the parents. But then the other biggest thing that just happened yesterday is the ribbon cutting with Tampa Family Health. They're one of our core partners, as I mentioned, and health and wellness is one of those pillars. If you have a clinic close enough for the families to go to, they will go. And that is our goal is really get them the medical needs um, medical services that they need to meet the needs. Is it immunizations? Is it 
kids that have asthma, but they don't have their asthma pumps? Is it kids that have um, chronic diabetes and no one's ever tested them because they don't know how to get to the clinic? As we've talked about walkability, this is a walking community. So we need to make sure that the things that they need are accessible by foot. Not everyone has a car, not everyone can ride the bus, not everyone can pay for an Uber. So Tampa Family Health, originally our plan was to put it on our campus. It was going to be on the school grounds and it just didn't work out logistically, but they found property right up the street from our school and built a state-of-the-art brand new clinic right up the road. So our families will have that access and we have a health and wellness coordinator who will work with them and is already working with them to make sure that our students' needs are met medically and the families. So it's not only accessible for the students, but their parents and the community as a whole. You know, just based on everything that you said, I mean, Mort is truly a community school. It, it serves not just the kids, but not, and not just parents. It's just the community as a whole. So, I mean, kudos to everyone that's involved with that effort. I think it's awesome. I want to start the next question. You and we know that this is a walkable community and Sarah and her team are making sure that that's enhanced. So it's even we have more walking options. But with that comes the word safety. And we know that we still have challenges um, regarding safety in, in all of our communities. Emil, how safe do you feel in school when you go to school? And how safe do you feel here in this community? Uh, I, I feel very safe, actually. You know, I, I trust, I trust uh, the workers at my school to, to handle this uh, with caution. And, you know, I think we just we should be able to share if we feel unsafe. Um, thank you for giving me this outlet. Um, I also feel very safe in my community. I mean, we have a, a great little family here making sure that we do, you know. Um, just uh, masks are optional, so if, if you feel unsafe, you can always, you know, wear your mask, uh, make sure you stay social distance. I'm, I'm sure the teachers would love to accommodate um, students if they, if they want to maintain that, you know. It's just, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're coming back. Good, good. Trust me, I think a lot of parents are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it was said earlier, I mean, it's now you're transitioning back to school. So there are certain things that you have to remember. Like you're going to class. You have to, have to wear pants now. Right? So, so I we certainly kind of have to learn that. We're going back to school. <laughs> so, so we have and, and so we have a couple of things that, you know, you're, you're changing not just the way that you're learning, but also how you interact, right? And so Stevie, as an, as an educator, now you have to know that there are gonna be some youth that are coming in and they're on high alert. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they, they have these concerns, they're, they're going into a new environment or they're going they're re-entering a new environment. How prepared do you think are, that teachers are to respond to the different concerns mm -hmm. and needs for all these students that are going back? Um, I've been uh, very fortunate to have like mental health training through the district last year. And I mean, this has been a, a constant conversation within our school about not just to address the health, like the physical well-being, but the mental well-being mm -hmm. of our students, because we know they can't learn if they're going through emotional stress. Um, so. We got about six hours of training just on different, like how to look for like mental distress, how to talk to students, uh, what our different um, services are within our own individual school, because every school is different, how to make referrals and things like that. So, and also um, how to have like the class community conversations so um so we can try to find the students that that need our help kylia you know mort is more to support it greatly by the surrounding community right and you all you have your amazon list and you have donors that can you know are providing support to you but a lot of our schools don't have that level of support so what's your advice to other schools who aren't as well funded and supported how can they work with the community to get that support at the same level that more has one of the things i would say is know who you are build your brand of your school who is your school who are you serving who are your people who are your students and help them take pride in who they are and then market yourself get to know the community and the businesses that are surrounding your school and then get out there have those conversations meet the people talk to them because what we want people to understand is that even though our kids are elementary pre-k all the way up to fifth grade we're building little learners we're building 
little community citizens. We're trying to build responsible adults through our CASA program, through our student leadership council, through all the things that we're doing, we're building our students to be productive citizens. And so you really have to market that and get out and talk about what your school is doing. Have leadership at your school that's proud of your school. If your leadership isn't proud, the staff won't be proud, the students won't be proud, and the parents won't be proud. It'll just be mundane, we're going to school to learn, and you go back home. No, we're a family at our school, and we really work hard to be cohesive in all the things that we do, um, and really just sharing all the information about all the programs, all the services. We have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook page specific to our Parent Resource Center. Um, and so we're just constantly putting information out there. So you have to be your own brand ambassador. Awesome. Shayla, August 10th, day one, 6 a.m., you're getting up. <laughs> What's that conversation like? With my child or myself? <laughs> I mean, like my son right now is at more helping with, like she said, the cafeteria. We don't speak of that place. But, um, ugh. like, we're ready. We're ready. Uniforms, we're ordering. Wake up, sweetie. It's time. I mean, as a parent, I mean, I can, I have those resources to make sure he's ready with uniforms. Like, I don't have to get supplies, thankfully, because we have it at the school. Um, for our other parents, just to piggyback off of what Kalia mentioned, what we have at the school, our other parents who might not have the resources to get everything, we have a clothing closet. So we have brand new uniforms, actually, with our logo, without our logo. We have bottoms, um, undergarments, shoes, socks. We get donations, jackets, brand, some brand new clothing, some used. So we do have parents right now calling the school, letting us know what house color their child wears so we can get uniforms ready. So the first day of school, August 10th, like you said, six o'clock, wake up. It is time to go. Get out. I will see you when the bell rings, you know, but... I think, I mean, we're, we're getting there. We get calls from parents every single day, you know, whether they need food, we have food pantry, you know, most of, I wanna say what, like 97% at least of our kids and families are on free or reduced lunch. So they don't have to worry about lunch, they don't have to worry about breakfast, just bring your child to school. Get them there, we'll do everything else, so. But my child, he's ready. I don't know if he's ready, but You're ready. I'm ready for him. Yes. And you will get him ready. He will be there with bells and whistles on. He is ready. So I want to make sure that everyone understands that these forums were put together really to bring the community together. But they started in the wake of the tragedy uh, in, in Minnesota. And we wanted to make sure that we addressed bringing the community together, improve relationships with law enforcement, and then address equity and policy. Emil, how do you feel regarding law enforcement here in the university area? Do you feel that they're doing a good job? Is there anything they need to work on to improve the relationship between residents in the university area and current law enforcement? Uh, no, yeah, I, I certainly feel good with our law enforcement here. I think we just need to build uh, more of a relationship with them, um, just all around, you know, um, actual, like have actual communication with them. Even us kids, you know, maybe they could come in um, and uh, talk to us every once in a while or any any of those kind of sort of things um, I think would be very helpful as, into creating like a healthy healthy relationship with a uh, law enforcement mm -hmm. especially from a young age seeing all this I'm sure can um, greatly affect the way you um, view them you know so I think I think it's just creating healthy relationships and uh, I, I, yeah yeah, awesome. Kalia, over at Mort, I mean, do you have your, how, how are the school resource officers and the support from the sheriff's office? How does that work over at Mort? It's great. We keep a school resource officer on campus and we make sure that they understand you're not there to threaten our students. You're there to be a link for them with law enforcement, just as Emil was saying. Um, we also have a partnership with the uh, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department and I'll point him out, I'm going to put him on the spot. We have a new deputy who's been assigned to us, Deputy Stone back there. Um, we had... <laughs> 
We formerly had Deputy Alvarez, and she moved into a different position, and so they assigned us a new deputy, not as a school resource officer, but just as a community officer to be a part of our committees and the work that we're doing. So we are happy to have law enforcement. When they come on our campus, they get to know our kids. Um, with Speaking of Deputy Alvarez, I'm sorry, Tomasic, her new married name, um, she would come on campus and the kids would know her. They would dance with her, they would talk with her, the parents got to know her, they would see her here at community events and things like that. So for us, it's very important for our officer, school resource officer, and our partnership with the uh, Sheriff's Department to know, to know that they need to uh, be a face, be a positive face and be a positive force um, with the parents and not just, oh, we're here to arrest you and take your child away. Awesome. Deputy uh, Stone, so you heard that the kids dance with <laughs> Deputy Massey, so with a, with a name like Stone, just be ready. <laughs> just be ready. <laughs> so unfortunately, we couldn't have one of our school board members here. Um, and. and she wanted to be here, but had some things to come up. We have a teacher, we have a student, we have an administrator, we have a parent. Uh, we are recording this, and so we want to share this out. So we want to close this out with what's one thing, we know some great things that are happening at schools and with teachers and students, but what's the one thing the school board should know um, from a teacher's perspective, a youth's perspective, administrator, and a parent that they should work on this coming year? As a science teacher, you know, follow and keep up with the science. I mean, we we have the CDC and we have recommendations, and so um, just uh, in the partnership with Tampa General. So you know, if they make certain recommendations, like you know, if we do need to go back to being fully masked, then we we should follow their guidance. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just think we need to have a good uh, communication, you know, um, constantly see how students are feeling about their environment, um, their learning environment, you know, just all of that. Uh, I think I think the the speed at, at which we teach and all that, just um, trying to see if the students are keeping up, all those sort of things are very um, crucial in order to make this transition go by smoothly. So, yeah, just those things. I, I think this is more natural than learning online, so I don't think it'll be as much of a challenge as as it previously was, you know? Kelly? Um, for us, we just want the school board to continue to support our efforts and understand that we have great administrators who are doing the work and continue to need their support and encouragement um, and giving us the, the leeway to do the things that we're doing and having that uh, flexibility to have the partners at our school and volunteers and we wouldn't survive without those people being contributors to the work that we're doing. So just continue to support us and know that we're working to, like I said earlier, build our little our little citizens. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> as a parent, not an employee, just to remember to keep, like I know with everything that's been going on with the school board over the past, what, two years, just to always remember we care about, they care about the employees, of course, but the kids come first. So, you know, especially with cuts, which we understand, but you can't think to have these kids grow when there's 30 kids in a class. You know, not necessarily speaking on more, but just in general as a parent, just always remember to keep the kids first and, you know, get their opinion sometimes, see what they think, come to the schools and really see what we need at our schools, not just sitting back, looking at numbers. You really need to get in there at every school and see what every individual community needs because there's no school that's the same. Very good, so I'm hearing we want the school board to communicate, to listen, and most importantly, support our kids. And that will help us focus forward. So I want, I want to thank our panelists uh, for coming up and sharing with us. Thank you all. On behalf of the CDC and the Partners Coalition, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for taking the time to join us and making this conversation a priority. As discussed, our educational system and institutions continue to navigate unprecedented waters, and while they still face many challenges, there is much opportunity as well. It's important to have these conversations to ensure our youth are supported, feel safe, and equally have the chance to thrive during their educational journey. Now it's time to shine a light on a deep-rooted small business in the university area as we move to our Small Biz equals Big Impact segment. For today's feature, we focus on Barber Extraordinaire, soon to be the newly renamed Uptown Barbershop. 
Barber Extraordinaire's owner, Roger Neal, is a longtime com community resident who knows the tremendous impact that giving back makes. Let's take a look at a short video that portrays just how he does it. Okay. Hello, world. This is Roger Neal, owner of Barber's Extraordinaire. That probably will be changed in the next six months. The year of 95, 96, opportunity presented itself. I had the money, I had the credit. I got my own business started with the help of my sister, naming it. I love this area, love this community, and I've seen this community change over the course of my 25 years being here. I don't mind helping, this community helps me. It helped me grow, it helped me raise my two boys. It helped me meet, meet my wife. It, it helped, so why not give back to this community and university area, because you can see what they're doing. You see them cleaning up the area. You see people having a, their first chance at getting homes in this area, and you just see them giving people chances that normally they wouldn't get, so why not help? I just think that I have the ability to affect this community directly because every walk of life in this community comes to this barbershop. They come to barbers for two things. They come to us to look good and they come for advice. That's my impact, to be able to try and redirect negatives into positives and, and change people's lives. I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to be here with us in person today. It has been my pleasure to host the Third Quarter Partners Coalition Gathering of 2021. Lastly, I invite you to save the date of Thursday, October 21st for our Fourth Quarter Partners Coalition Gathering of 2021. We intend for that gathering to again be in person as long as COVID cooperates. So please make plans to join us. And thank you again to all of our sponsors and partners. Until then, stay safe, stay focused, and make a difference. We'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>